Hello, everyone. So in this final half of the final section of chapter 12 that we'll be discussing, uh, we're going to talk about how the presence of solute particles within a solution will actually modify the properties of a solvent. Um, we're going to focus primarily on two solvent properties. We're going to focus on freezing point and boiling point and how those two properties change if I introduce a solute into a solvent. And so let's briefly discuss why it is that the properties change and how, and then we'll go through a mathematical example as to how we would actually do such a calculation. And so let's have a look at these first two diagrams that are on the screen right now. Here I have a diagram where I'm studying ice with no salt present, and then ice to which I've added some salt or a solute. Okay, so if we look at the diagram on the left, we can see that the water molecules, which are modeled using these blue circles, they're in a very organized structure, and there are very organized and neat attractions between each water molecule that produces the highly ordered structure of ice. Um, but when I introduce a solute, basically if you can imagine using these red circles as solute particles, notice that what happens is these red solute particles almost run interference. Essentially, the connections can't be as ordered because the red particles are in the way. Uh, basically, because of that lack of order, then basically ice has a tougher time maintaining its crystalline structure. Now, in order for the crystal structure to sort of form even with the presence of the solute particles within the solvent, then basically what has to happen is you have to remove more energy from the mixture. Okay, and so essentially what that translates into is basically the freezing point will actually be decreased as compared to the original freezing point of the pure solvent. Now, this behavior where solute particles sort of run interference is also essentially a good model to follow when we're thinking about what's going to happen to the boiling point of the solvent. Once again, I have pure water, if you will, over here on the container on the left, and I have water to which I've added some salt, or essentially a solute, on the right. And essentially, when a solvent boils, basically what happens is, as you increase the temperature and as you reach that boiling point, what's going to happen is more and more of these water particles that are in the liquid phase will gather enough energy and actually escape the liquid phase entirely to enter the gas phase or the vapor phase. But once again, if we think about what happens if I introduce a solute, again, these circles in red, notice that they also sort of run interference. And essentially what will happen is, say, for example, this water molecule right here that I'm underlining, if it wants to escape the liquid phase and go to the gas phase, notice it sort of has to push past these two solute particles that are sort of in its way. And so essentially every single water molecule in the system will sort of face that same struggle, where basically it has to avoid and sort of navigate around solute particles that are introduced into the solvent. And so because of that, each of these water molecules require more energy. Okay, so if they require more energy, it must be provided, meaning you must actually increase the temperature further for the water molecules to actually get this additional energy they need to avoid the solute particles as they try to escape the liquid phase. And so that translates into the boiling point of the solution actually being increased as compared to the boiling point of the original solvent. And so now that we have some qualitative ideas to why this happens, let's actually talk about how we attach some numbers to this. So I have an example problem here. Okay, basically they're asking me to calculate the boiling point elevation and the freezing point depression of a solution that I make by dissolving 12.2 grams of potassium chloride in 45 grams of water. I'm also provided two constants. This one right here that they label KB is what we call the molal boiling point constant. 
And this one they label KF is the molal freezing point constant. And to do this calculation, there's a very simple formula. And the formula actually has the same format, whether you're dealing with freezing point depression or boiling point elevation. Basically, the difference in temperature for, say, the freezing point is going to equal this factor I, which I'll define in a moment, times the molality of the solution times the molal freezing point constant. Okay, this factor I is actually called the Van Hoff factor. And it's sort of a fancy name for the number of particles that are produced when the solution is made. Then this lowercase m is the molality of the solution, which we learned to calculate just yesterday. And like I said, this kf is the molal freezing point constant. And so if I were going to calculate the change in the freezing point of the solution, I would need to first include the Van Hoff factor for a solution of potassium chloride. Now, think back to the beginning of the chapter. Potassium chloride, when I put it into water, all right, will dissociate, it will break apart into potassium cations in the aqueous state and chloride ions in the aqueous state. And so that means that there are two particles formed when the salt dissolves. So the Van Hoff factor for a potassium chloride solution should be 2. Now to calculate the molality, if you remember, molality, molality sorry, is moles of solute per kilogram of solvent. So that means I'm going to go and start with my 12.2 grams of potassium chloride. I'm going to divide it by my 45 grams of water. I'm going to change the grams of potassium chloride to moles so that I have moles of solute in my numerator. And I'm going to convert these grams of water to kilograms. So there are 1,000 grams of water in one kilogram of water. All right, so basically, this whole portion of my math would actually calculate the molality of the solution for me. Then I would go and I would actually substitute in the molal freezing point constant. Notice that my molality units here would cancel with all of the units that I have in my center set of parentheses here. And I'm just going to be left with a answer that's in degrees Celsius. So if I take 2, multiply by 12.2, divide by 45, divide by 74.55, multiply by 1,000, and multiply by 1.86, if I do that math, I come up with 13.5 degrees Celsius. So that would mean, again, remembering that the freezing point of water is 0 degrees Celsius, that means the freezing point of the solution would be negative 13.5 degrees Celsius, okay? They also asked me for the boiling point elevation of the same solution. So again, we already know that our equation has a similar format. It would be the Van Hoff factor for the solution, the molality, but this time I'm gonna multiply by the molal boiling point constant that I was given in the problem. So if I go ahead and do my substitution, that's, two, because again of the two particles, the potassium cation and the chloride anion that are present in solution, my molality calculation would be identical to the one that I did for the molality of solution that I calculated for the freezing point depression calculation. So I'm just going to reproduce that here. And then to finish off, the calculation, I would multiply by the molal boiling point constant, which would be 0 0.512 degrees Celsius per molal. So again, my molality units would cancel with everything in my center set of parentheses. And if I do this math, take 2, multiply by 12.2, .2, 
divide by 45, divide by 74.55, multiply by 1,000, and then multiply by 0 0.512, I end up with 3.72. Degrees Celsius. So that means that the boiling point of this solution should be 3.72 degrees Celsius higher than the boiling point of water. And the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. So I would add this temperature to 100 and get a new boiling point for the solution of 103.72 degrees Celsius. Or if I round that to three significant figures, that'd be 104 degrees Celsius. Okay, so now that you've seen this walk through at least once, go ahead and try the follow-up questions attached to this pre-lecture tutorial. Again, we'll be discussing this material in class tomorrow. If you have any questions, by all means, email or bring them up in class. Okay, I'll see you guys tomorrow.